And so welcome everyone to Living Lab Ontario and Growing Potatoes with Cover Crops. I'm uh, very fortunate that Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario and the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association together with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and our other partners are able to host this event. Um, like I said, there's a, been a lot of interest on it. Today we're welcoming Ken Lang from Living Lab Ontario and Ryan Barrett from Living Lab Atlantic to talk about their experiences growing potatoes with cover crops. I'm going to just provide a short overview of what Living Lab is so that everyone is familiar, those who, who maybe have not heard of, of this before. So again, bear with me as I share my screen for those who know my technical prowess, this is always a challenge. So just Tracy, one Tracy, I wonder if you can turn off your notifications. We're hearing your, your Zoom pings. Are you? Okay. I don't know how to turn them off because mine are not on. Does anyone know? How to, how do, to do that? Good question. I'm actually not hearing them. Is anybody else hearing them? Or maybe it's only you, Sarah, as the co-host. Ah, okay. A new a new thing in Zoom. Okay. There you go. Okay. Oh. Excellent. Glad to hear it. I was a little again. I thought one more thing I need to learn. All right. So. Just to give you an overview of um, Living Lab project in Canada. Um, so welcome. And without further ado, we'll just move on. So the Living Lab is an initiative through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and it's an integrated approach to agricultural innovation. It brings farmers, scientists, and other partners together to co-develop, test, monitor new practices and technologies in a real-life context. Living Lab Ontario is one of the four existing Living Labs, and there will be more coming out under the Agricultural Climate Solutions. But together, there's the Eastern Prairie, Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic, which is hosted in PEI. It's user-centered, so it focuses on the user's needs and the users are involved throughout the process. Uh, they work in part, it works in partnership with experts from various disciplines. So we have a number of different researchers and areas coming into play and uh, experts who participate in the project. And then it's in real life context. So this is on working farms where the farmers use the technology or the practice. And today you're going to hear about that. We have a variety of partners um, associated with our living lab in Ontario, we have conservation authorities, the ecological farmers, as well as two other um, agricultural organizations, Environment and Climate Change Canada, but this is all funded through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, so we are very fortunate to have a living lab. We have uh, six producers who are looking at a variety of different technologies in Ontario. Two of those are hosted by the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario and uh, two, three are hosted by uh, Innovative Farmers of Ontario and one of those is hosted by Ontario Soil and Crop. And here's our six cooperators, but we'll um, dive into Ken's as we move forward. If you want to learn more about Living Lab, you certainly can visit either of the organization's websites or the other organizations who have been uh, involved. So without further ado, because we are going to have um, a very limited time together and a lot to learn today and hear about. I'm going to welcome Ryan Barrett uh, from Living Lab Atlantic. Ryan is the research and agronomy specialist with the Prince Edward Island Potato Board in Charlottetown. In this role, he coordinates local and national research projects with a number of different partners, as well as conducting on-farm research trials with PEI potato growers. Ryan has a BSc from Dalhousie Faculty of Agriculture and an MSc from the University of Guelph. He's worked with the PEI Potato Board since 2012, and previous to that, he worked with the purebred dairy cattle industry. As well, he continues to be involved with his family's dairy farm in Belmont, PEI. He's a professional agrologist and he serves as vice president of the PEI Institute of Agrologists. 
Ryan, you're a busy guy. He's also a certified crop advisor for the Atlantic provinces. Oh, and he was recently elected to the board of directors of the Potato Association of America. It's quite, so we are very pleased to have Ryan here with us today to talk about the living lab experience with potatoes and cover crops. So Ryan, over to you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Had myself on uh, on a preemptive mute, and of course needed to take myself off. So, um, thank you for inviting me to come and speak to you today. Um, I uh, I'm going to be pre presenting some of the work that we've been doing uh, with cover crops ahead of potatoes as part of uh, a living lab uh, project here in PEI. So, just a, a little bit of background about uh, agriculture in Prince Edward Island. Um, for those that are less than familiar, we generally have a sandy loam soil, which is reasonably consistent across the province. Um, we get a significant amount of rainfall. We don't always get it when we want it, um, but we're generally not lacking in rainfall. Uh, we're the largest producer of potatoes in Canada. Last year, we produced somewhere around 28 million hundredweight of potatoes, which uh, definitely had us in first place in, in the country. The next largest crops, of course, are things like uh, small grains and oil seeds and forages. Uh, we have a reasonably strong dairy industry for the size of our province. Uh, our hog industry is largely declined uh, to very little. Our beef industry is starting to resurge uh, again after a tough time following BSE. We have a very highly regulated industry. So compared to a lot of other provinces, you know, we have crop rotation legislation, we have uh, enhanced buffer zones, ALICE programs, slope requirements, um, we have a new soil health monitoring program for water permits. Um, and uh, most potatoes in PEI are in a three or four year rotation. There are some that are in longer rotations, but that's sort of the, the general gist. So uh, growing potatoes, generally uh, uh, they require tillage. And for folks that are used to a more of a no-till system, this can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge and uh, maybe uh, takes some getting used to or getting your head around. Traditionally, the rotation that we've had in PEI is a like potato followed by barley, uh, which usually was underseeded with red clover or some sort of red clover grass. And then the third year was red clover that was done for either for as just a mulch crop or as a, um, uh, or, or, you know, there was hay or silage taken off. Um, that was what I would call the traditional rotation. Our rotations have become a lot more sophisticated and diverse in the last number of years. Um, there is some, some opportunity for minimum tillage in that rotation, uh, but we still require, you know, tillage of, and, you know, breaking up that sod ground ahead of potatoes. And um, generally what was done was fall plowing with, no cover crops in the late fall. And that, you know, historically led to a lot of nitrate leaching. It generally led to a long-term decline in soil organic matter. It led to a lot of erosion problems. Um, we've also seen a big move away from red clover uh, in the last, say, five to 10 years. Um, red clover in a potato rotation can multiply some, some bad actors like nematodes and verticillium and wireworm. And so there's been a bit of a movement towards things like alfalfa, but also some annual forages like sorghum sudan grass and pearl millet. But there's still this need for, you know, getting the land ready for potatoes the following year. And in PEI, we have a pretty short season um, compared to a lot of places, especially southern Ontario. And there's usually isn't enough time uh, to, for most people to plow the majority of their acres in the spring and still be ready to plant potatoes in, in May. Um, and uh, there's some spring plowing that happens, but it is uh, it is a challenge. So there is a uh, historically a lot of the, the the that tillage was done in sort of late October, early you know into November after the potatoes were harvested. There's a big risk of you know these are wet conditions. We get a risk of soil compaction. We got a risk of erosion. We've got nitrate losses. Doesn't look good. It's not. It's definitely far from ideal. 
So where we've been trying to work with growers and do some do some research and do some uh, some demos and things is around uh, improving the amount of covers before potatoes. So this involves moving that primary tillage up to late August, early September before we get into potato digging time, follow, immediately followed by cover crop seeding. Um, so this gets that land you know tilled and out of the way early when they're not quite as busy. Um, there's lots of time to get a healthy green cover crop established, protecting the soil uh, and also feeding the soil. Um, generally, uh, we're, growers are then picking varieties that will winter kill. They are, uh, they'll stay green until sort of December, January, but they will tend to die out over winter. So they don't need to be terminated or, or tilled additionally in the spring. And this uh, generally can save some, some tillage as well. Uh, and um, this, that seeding, um, sort of preparing the ground and seeding can often be done in one pass now with people with, you know, seeders on their tillage equipment and that sort of thing. Um, we also have some farms that are introducing what I call ridging or hilling as well. So um, where they're sort of making the hills and putting the cover crop on. And we've seen some, uh, some we've done some research on that. And I, I think there's some, there's some benefit there in terms of getting the ground warmed up a little faster in the spring. Uh, when, when you're uh, putting cover crops in late August, early September, you got lots of options. So we've got uh, growers that are looking at, you know, spring barley, oats, winter rye, oilseed radish, tillage radish, brown mustard, annual rye grass, and mixtures of, of these different sort of grasses and brassicas. And, uh, and what we're doing is we're trying to compare some of these like single species against each other, but also mixtures and then comparing them, of course, against no cover uh, check strips. So research to drive adoption, you know, uh, when I'm involved in on farm research, I'm involved in grower led and grower oriented uh, research. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in research that drives an adoption of a, of a beneficial practice. And so as part of that process, we need to answer some questions. We need to answer, and these are the questions that the growers will have, uh, and that is how easy is it to implement? What's the cost of doing it? What's the impact on the soil health and the soil organic matter? How quickly am I gonna improve both? And in our rotation and in our system, overarching everything, what is the impact on potato yield and quality? Compared to a lot of other crops, you know, potatoes are a very high value crop, but also a very high input crop. So, you know, this year with the increased cost of fertilizer and labor and fuel and everything, we're projecting, you know, an average all-in cost of, uh, of uh, production of somewhere close to $4,000 an acre. So you have to be um, staying on top of things and you have to be uh, doing something that's going to improve or maintain or improve yield and not uh, be overly costly. So what are we doing through Living Labs Atlantic? Uh, we are in our more specific trial. Uh, we are looking at eight fields a year on grower fields where we're comparing different cover crops after tillage in the year before potatoes with no cover uh, check strips. So these are done on sort of two year cycles. As you can see, uh, there's um, the, the fall cover the year before and then following it up or following the potato crop uh, that was in that field the next year. The type of the data that we're collecting, we're doing a percentage ground cover in those cover crops. We're looking at the erosion potential. I'll have a picture of uh, one of our splash pans in another uh, slide. Uh, soil chemistry, you know, uh, you know, your basic soil test information, soil health metrics from the PEI Department of Agriculture, verticillium and root lesion nematodes, which are soil borne diseases uh, and vectors of disease here in, in potato production, and then also. Uh, potato yield and quality. So what are some of the trends that we've seen? We've completed two of these cycles and we'll be completing the, the third one this year. Um, in general, we haven't seen any sort of real short-term gain in organic matter or active carbon or aggregate stability from those cover crop treatments. That being said, uh, I don't know that we ha have the sensitivity in our testing to be able to really uh, detect much in that way, as well as um, the time frame is fairly short. So um, we're definitely not seeing a decline, um, but we may need a bit more um, 
may need, may need to see it over, over a lo longer length of time to really see some of those uh, gains. We are seeing a, a slight trend towards improvement in soil respiration and biological nitrogen availability uh, in the cover crop plots uh, or cover crop treatments as paired, compared to the no cover treatments. Uh, we're measuring erosion potential. These are the, the splash pans that we use to sort of model uh, erodibility uh, of soil come, uh, where there's a cover crop versus no cover crop. And we've seen, you know, in where we have a cover crop, we definitely have somewhere around 50% less soil accumulated in those splash pans uh, compared to the, uh, the no cover checks. Ground cover. Uh, so on the left, you'll see uh, there's just a little bit of a that, that's the black and white version of the, uh, for, uh, the imaging that we get from the Canopio app where we're comparing, looking at percentage of green cover uh, from, from just regular imagery on our phone. And um, we've generally seen that the, okay, obviously the earlier, the better. So, you know, um, the earlier the cover crop can be established, the better cover we get. Um, generally we see higher levels of cover with mixtures. So where, especially where we've got a grass, like a grain, oats paired with a brassica, they, they tend to be very complementary in terms of maximizing coverage. Uh, we can get up to about 70, 85% green cover by late October with some of these covers or with the, some of the mixtures. And interestingly, where we've run a few trials with growers where they've used say multiple seeding rates uh, on the, um, on say oats or something and increasing the seeding rate didn't really improve cover that much. So um, just, just more does not always equal better. So if people can kind of keep their costs down a little bit in terms of uh, getting, uh, getting ground covered. Verticillium and nematodes, we haven't seen a big difference uh, between covers and, and checks. Um, don't really think that there's enough time to impact the verticillium uh, cycle very much. And on uh, say the um, uh, nematodes, we are not seeing uh, the same issues. Uh, like we see sometimes some will increase, some will decrease. It's, I think it's very field specific. Um, I think the increase in nematodes is definitely more related to severity of the winter, length of rotation, what was grown before, that sort of thing. Where we've seen the most impact has been on um, these marketable yields um, and, and total yields. So this is our data from the fields that were in uh, seeded in covers in 2019 and that were in potatoes in 2020. Um, you can see three of the fields had a statistical uh, increase that are in bold in uh, marketable yield and crop value. And the overall trend across all those comparisons was about 2,400 weight an acre, uh, which is uh, about seven to 8% yield improvement. And uh, so we were interested in, in that, you know, we only had uh, two fields that were uh, numerically negative, but we're not statistically lower. Um, but the trend was you know, in favor, or at least it appeared to be a bit of a trend, but we want, of course, to see how this will go uh, in another year. So then this is the data from last year. Uh, so again, we have three, fee three comparisons that are uh, statistically uh, um, positive and significantly positive uh, in favor of the cover crops as opposed to uh, the, the check strips. And again, we have across sort of average the trend across the, the fields is somewhere again in that same sort of ballpark in that, you know, 28 to 25, 25 to 30 hundred weight yield improvement and about a 385 to $415 an acre yield improve or uh, crop value improvement. So this, you know, it was very interesting and very encouraging to see a similar trend two years in a row. So, um, and I said, we have, we have another year's worth of data to, to pull out of that this year. This was just comparing all of the covers against all of the checks last year. And in this case, we did see, you can see we ended up with about a, you know, a 37 hundred weight uh, yield improvement uh, and about $500 crop value. Um, I, th I think this is probably a bit high. I'd probably more comfortable with the 25 to 30 level, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how, how the data looks another year. What's interesting is we don't see a big difference in the, in sort of the, 
the grade standards, like we're not seeing a really big difference in defects or size distribution, those sorts of things, or disease, mostly just seeing it in, to in increased yields. So, so far, as I said, there appears to be a trend towards about a 25 to 30 hundred weight yield improvement. And that's, as I said, that's about, in PEI, that's about a seven to eight percent yield improvement. And that's pretty impressive and, and, and pretty significant. Um, because as I have down there in red, if we're looking at about a $400 an acre improvement in, in uh, yield and in, and in crop value, um, but the cost of the cover crop, a lot of these fall cover crops, um, it basically you have to do the tillage, people are doing the tillage anyway. So we're looking at the cost of, you know, seeding a cover, the cost of the seed, the cost of seeding the cover. We're not applying any fertility to that. We're only looking at about 40 to $50 an acre in most cases. And some of that may even be on the high side. So we are looking at a, you know, an eight or 10 to one uh, payback on, on what we're doing there. As I said, in potatoes being a high value crop, I think there's probably faster payback on the use of cover crops than maybe in corn and soybeans where, you know, we're not looking as, as you know, like an incremental increase in yield doesn't have the same uh, value as that same incremental increase in potatoes. Uh, and then, of course, this is just the short-term benefits. This isn't talking about any of the long-term benefits like reduced soil erosion and increased soil organic matter and improved soil health and all the other reasons that we want to look at increasing our use of cover crops. So, uh, so yeah, there's lots, lots of reasons to be optimistic here. Um, where has this gone in terms of the adoption rate of cover cropping in PEI? So, we had we had a fair amount of people that have been doing cover cropping after potatoes for the you know for quite a while in PEI. It has definitely trended upwards in the last number of years, and we're now up to about fifty two and a half percent of potato acres that have a, a cover crop following potato harvest. But where we've really seen this adoption curve accelerate is on the before potato planting. So it used to be less than a quarter of potato fields going into potatoes that had a cover uh, in the before winter. And now we're up apparently over half. So, uh, that's really encouraging. Um, and we're hoping that we'll be able to continue that momentum. Um, the PEI department of agriculture has a, a program that incentivizes cover cropping. There's the new on-farm climate action fund, which I think will also have significant dollars going into driving that adoption. So hopefully we can combine some of the data that we're getting from living labs and the testimonials of these growers and be able to actually turn that into uh, uh, you know even higher adoption rates. So that's mostly what I have to share with you this morning or this afternoon, I suppose. Um, just uh, briefly to thank some of our partners, of course, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, our key partners with the living labs. Uh, the Ag, uh, East Prince Agri-Environment Association, which is the sort of the lead organization for the external project here in PEI. Um, we work a lot with the watershed groups here to help us with data collection. So uh, there's three watershed groups that are listed there. And then um, here in, with, with the potato board, I, my AIM program is, is the uh, program that I, uh, you know, con conducts and, and funds a lot of our on-farm research, of course, Thank you to, uh, to the potato growers of PEI, the uh, Cavendish Farms, PEI Department of Agriculture, and again, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for uh, being part of our, our funding program uh, for our AIM program. So with that, um, I guess I'll open it if we have a time for any questions. Um, can I just suggest, Ryan, that we wait um, so sure. we can hear from Ken, and then we'll have questions posed to both of you if that's okay. No problem. All right, thank you. All right, Ken, do you want me to share your slides? Uh, let me um, try from here, uh, okay. just because I can speed it up. Uh... Okay, but. Perfect. Oh, right. you've got the blue screen up there. Yes, I do. I'll give you a I'll give it you a short introduction, and okay. uh, since um, 
everyone can can get to know who Ken is. Um, Ken grew up on a farm near St. Mary's, and he did, he dabbled in studying engineering, and then and then um, discovered that his true passion was farming, and did a, a degree in horticulture from University of Guelph. He and his wife Martha have been on her family's farm since Spar in Sparta since 1979. They spent 20 years running a pick your own farm with strawberries, raspberries, peaches, and elderberries and made the switch to being organic growers in 1989. They developed a market garden and growing vegetables through community supported agriculture shares. And they've been do did that for about 20 years. Ken's now semi-retired and his daughter, Ellen has taken over management of the market garden. And as I, anyone who knows Ken and I've had the pleasure of serving on other committees with Ken and getting to know him through Living Lab, he is always looking for better ways to farm and opportunities to address um, issues that, that come from farming. So uh, through Living Lab, he saw an ideal opportunity to address the concerns with excess tillage and negative impact on soil health in organic farming systems. And that brought him to his trials with no-till potatoes and maintaining cover throughout the potato production cycle. So Ken, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Uh, we've heard great things from Ryan as in terms of uh, using cover crops uh, before and after potatoes. So um, let's uh, see what happens if we try to uh, have that cover crop uh, on the ground right through the potato production cycle. So this is just the sign at my gate uh, letting me people know that uh, I am part of the Living Labs initiative. And uh, Oh, the arrow, the orange arrow down here near Sparta, just north of Lake Erie, is where our farm's located, just south of London. And these were the sort of guiding principles, the criteria that I used uh, in this horticultural site of EFAOs uh, as part of the Living Labs Ontario. And we were really setting out to develop organic no-till strategies for vegetable crops. And we were avoiding the use of agricultural plastics. Uh, we wanted biological solutions. And it's based on a 60 inch bed system, which is pretty common in sort of mid-sized tractor based uh, market garden situations. Uh, these plots you'll see pictures of, there was no hand or mechanical weeding during the growing season of any sort. Uh, so that the weed control is pretty much evident by observation. Uh, it was a three year project. The first two years was basically a survey to find promising techniques. And the third year, this year, uh, we'll have replicated plots of garlic and potatoes with side by side tilled and no-till uh, plots to provide some more reliable data. So here we are, uh, we'll jump right into uh, planting some no-till potatoes. So here we are last spring, I believe this planting was about April 27th. Uh, we were planting into a cover crop of rye and there is actually a, some hairy vetch mixed in there. Uh, this is actually a, a no-till transplanter, uh, a, um, a carousel type plug transplanter that we're using to plant the potatoes. Uh, it worked actually pretty well. We had to cut the seed pieces a little smaller than you would normally use so they didn't plug uh, in the tapered shoe that uh, this transplanter has, but we actually got it to plant potatoes. And uh, here we are, we also had another planting date, which was May 14th, and you can see the rye and vetch are quite a bit higher. Um, and here we are, um, this is about three, four weeks later, the potatoes, the first potatoes have started to emerge. Uh, the rye has gotten quite mature and is ready to terminate. And we're going to terminate it uh, with a, uh, a flail mower. Uh, here's just a shot of the uh, potato uh, tuber piece uh, that's uh, sprouted. And um, just to see how much development there has been. And here we are. Uh, that same day, uh, whacking off the cover crop of rye and vetch to leave a mulch on the ground. These, this is an organic situation, so we're depending on this residue to control the weeds right through the season. And off to the right here, you can see other plots. This is hairy vetch and some deep compost mulch plots that were part of the study as well with other vegetable crops. And here we are, I believe this is about the you know, third week or fourth week in June. The potatoes have emerged quite nicely right up through that uh, heavy mulch of mostly rye with a bit of hairy vetch, uh, but really quite excellent weed control at that stage. 
And here we are uh, just about time to harvest these potatoes. Uh, we still have excellent weed control. There's a few odd ones off to the side here. I think those were actually outside the plot. Uh, they just never got uh, pulled out. And here we are, this is digging the early ones. This is the end of August. Um, and this variety of potatoes, it's a red skinned, white fleshed potato variety that we've chosen uh, from some selections we got from the Bada Seed Initiative. Uh, it's actually called Orchard Hill Rose. Uh, we've selected it for its resistance to potato leaf hopper, but it also happens to be a very vigorous variety, which seemed to do quite well in these no-till trials. We did, uh, we had this very simple three-point hitch potato digger. We did have to add these, what they call carrot blades or just pointed uh, blades. It helped it uh, penetrate the quite firm soil because you have to remember this soil has not been tilled since the year before. The cover crop of Ryan vetch was planted September 1st, uh, the year before uh, with no tillage since. So this, the soil gets quite firm. We also added these discs on the edge to cut through the residue uh, and the plant tops to uh, so they didn't plug the, uh, the digger. And just to give you some idea of the yields in these plots, these weren't replicated plots, but we did have a few plots to give us some numbers. So the early August digging, uh, the yield was in excess of 35,000 pounds per acre. Uh, the later uh, digging, about a month later, um, we had a little bit higher yield, but we had some greening problems with the potatoes that were close to the surface. We did have five inches of rain and one rainfall event uh, between these two diggings, and it may have washed some of the residue off those uh, potatoes near the surface. And we also uh, mowed the tops off on the later uh, harvest and may have exposed them to more sunlight. So we did have some greening problems, and we did discover that we had some hollow heart in this variety. We did. Um, add some extra fertility during the growing season because the plants were looking a little short of nitrogen. So we side dressed them with about 1200 pounds per acre of organic layer hen pellets. It's just a dehydrated, uh, I believe it's been pasteurized by heat and pelleted uh, layer hen manure. Um, so it, it probably uh, applied about 50 pounds of nitrogen, but it was just you know spread on the surface, uh, wasn't, uh, uh, inserted into the ground in any way. But anyways, just to give you some comparison, I mean, the average yield from Statistics Canada information uh, for Ontario, the yield's about 21,000 pounds per acre. So we were well above that, even for these organic uh, no-till potato uh, trial. And uh, if you want more information, you're quite welcome to uh, contact me at my email address there. And also uh, there are some past and future reports uh, will be posted on this uh, Living Labs EFAO uh, site that's part of uh, EFAO's website. That's it. Uh, I guess we're ready for some questions perhaps. Yes, thank you very much, Ken and Ryan. And Ken, that was, that was uh, very short. Thank you. <laughs> You're gonna give us lots of time for questions um, together. And I see that we already have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Paul is asking, could the Ryan vetch be terminated with a roller crimper? Yes, that is a possibility. Uh, the trick is rye and vetch, hairy vetch don't always, uh, they're not always ready for termination at the same date. Uh, vetch is often a week or two later, and flail mowing is a little more forgiving. Uh, it's more likely to terminate both um, at, at the same time. Um, so we may try rolling next year, but um, it's, it's an option. I'm just not sure with the vetch whether it'd be as successful. Thank you. And our next question comes from Kate. And uh, Kate, I'm not sure who you were wanting to um, to to send this to, but you were saying, I wonder about the down pressure hurting the small potatoes. Um, it would depend on the timing. Potatoes are pretty tough. Is that with the, the, the removing the, there we go. Ken, did you have any issues with the greening is another one from Kate, but I think she was wondering about the down pressure of, of the um, action on the small, hurting the small potatoes. I don't, quite understand what she means by down pressure. Maybe 
yes. you can unmute and ask. Unmute, yes. That was with respect to the roller crimper, not with respect to anything else, just that conversation was going on in the chat. Oh, okay. But I think that there's advantages to both types of, of termination and I guess the timing on the cover crop size and the potato size, the little plants. I think, Kate, that those, those young potato plants are pretty tough and uh, I've got a lot of experience with roller crimpers and they don't actually exert that much pressure on the soil. Uh, when you've got that much residue, it's sort of gliding over the soil surface to some extent. So do you feel then the chopping does a much better job of terminating then? Well, yes, when you've got a mixture of hairy vetch and rye, yes. Um, but it, it has a downfall in that when you chop up a cover crop like that, it breaks down more quickly. Uh, the rye is pretty resistant to break down and we did have good weed control right through the season. So it didn't seem to be a disadvantage there, but. Uh, with other crops, it, it can be a disadvantage. Um, so in your feeling, the roller crimper would actually do a better job for weed control. And would it do a better job for then, I guess our concern often is the greening of the tubers, the daughter tubers that you're harvesting. Um, when you're, because I'm assuming they're not hilling these potatoes up, you're not going back in unless your cover crop is already on a hill and then you're planting into the hill with your plant it's hard to tell by the pictures if there's already a hill there no there were no hill it was level ground uh the greening problem that's a concern and we may try planting them a little bit deeper this year there's also the question of whether some varieties set their tubers higher in the soil than others although we couldn't find any information on that um, but we will plant some other varieties this year for comparison. I think Gold Rush is sort of a standard variety that we'll use to compare to the Orchard Hill rows. Yeah, there's definitely a, a difference in varieties. Some set right underneath the mother tuber or right around there so they can sort of pop up out of the hill and some spread out. So I wondered that too, and you'd have to, that's where I think the roller crimper might be better as you've indicated because it will give you more of a mat for hopefully longer in the season, but I still think you're going to have lots of green, depending on the soil health condition. <sighs> and I guess my other question was about the greening. So you've kind of answered that. Okay. Sarah, was there some there for Ryan, I see? Yeah, Scott, you have a question for Ryan, and we'd love for you to go on video and ask that question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, um, <clears throat> with those fields, like I noticed that in that one field, I think from 2021, it was, there was almost no effect of the cover crops, except there was one field was 70% yield, at least it was this way, or 70% change as far as I could, as far as I was seeing it. So um, <clears throat> I guess, was there any way that you could try to figure out or did you kind of go back to that field to try to figure out why there was such a drastic change in that particular field um i'm just gonna i'll share my screen again if that's all right just so i can refer yeah. to what you're talking about um so it, yeah it was uh um, that's yeah. not a percentage that's just a hundred weight so and that was and that field in particular okay. that was a very high yielding field like Yields were, I think average yield in that field was in 400 to 450 hundred weight. So percentage wise, it still was a, a big improvement, but it's not, that's not a percentage improvement. And then, so I guess like, so say with that 2020, yeah, the 2020 data, which probably the slot, yeah, the, cause I guess, cause it's, it's interesting. Cause like there's some, it doesn't seem to be a particular cover crop. It just seems to be some fields for some reason have a have an effect and some fields don't so well i guess I was... part of it is always down to um there, there's variability in sampling <coughs> so, so when yeah. we when we go in to do yield sampling we're taking somewhere between four and six 10 foot strips per treatment um and so within that you know we may not capture all the background variability that's why we never try and sort of 
pin everything on one field or uh, or you know one sample from one field. So that's why I like to look at the trends. So that's why like you know um, we have some individual fields where we have seen the ones that are here in bold where we say well st statistically uh, we're seeing some benefit. Um, we have other fields where we may not, but maybe there was no benefit for that particular field. Maybe there was an interaction where, you know, maybe there, there was a lot of, you know, uh, maybe the amount of cover, you know, took up nitrogen and, and maybe that, you know, was an issue. Um, we're still, you know, we all have to still figure that out a little bit. Generally, what we've seen is that, you know, over these two years of data, and we have, as we have another year of data to come, we're generally seeing a trend for, you know, 25 to 30 hundredweight yield improvement, which is, again, it's somewhere in that sort of seven to eight percent. And once we kind of do the full the full three years of data, we'll also we'll work with uh, hopefully some help, some folks with uh, Ag Canada that are a little bit more skilled on the statistics than I am. And we'll be able to maybe pull a bit more of this out and we'll be able to sort of tease apart. Do we see a difference between the grains and the brassicas, or do we see a difference between the mixtures and the single species, that sort of thing. So hopefully we'll have a little bit more to, to show you then. Yeah, actually, and I did kind of notice that it seemed like it was the grains that were the the better, seemed to be the ones that, that had the better responses. But but yeah, it'll be interesting to see, yeah, when you yeah. get that, so. I th I'd say th there's some trends, there's some preliminary trends to look at, but I'd really, uh, by the end of the, the, the end of this season, we'll have about 25 site years, and that should hopefully give us a little bit more re reliability in terms of making some questions or, you know, figuring where we're at. Okay. Okay. I must, I'll just say one, one last little comment. I'm, I'm coming from Alberta and that's, um, you probably, you probably get more rain in a year than we get in four years. So. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> so. Um, and your growing season, yeah, you you have a short growing season, but you can grow cover crops a long time, which we just. Well, we have an offset yeah. growing season. So actually, PEI in Alberta would have a similar growing season length, but yours starts a month earlier and ours goes about a month to a month and a half later. So it's just, it's, it tends to be offset a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But if you can get cover crops, even if it is a month offset, if you can still have cover crops growing in December, January, you know, yeah. here it's pretty well, October, it's. They might be green, but they're not growing. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So interesting. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you for that question. Um, we have lots of lots of uh, questions in the chat. So uh, we have a question about what effect does planting through the cover crops have on potato bugs? Um, uh, I can answer that. Um, we did have some potato bugs in the uh, like Colorado potato beetle. Uh, in our plots, and we sprayed them once with uh, Entrust, which is an organically uh, approved biocide. Um, uh, but curiously enough, we we kept scouting every week, and all we were finding was adults. So it looked like the the parasites, the predators, were keeping up with the the uh, larva for the rest of the season. And it's a very interesting question: is how much influence uh, does that cover crop lying on the ground, that residue of the cover crop have on the ecology of that uh, potato plant and that potato plot? Um, because we didn't really see much problems. And we had some till a tilled potato plot close by of my daughter's potatoes and, and they experienced quite a bit more uh, Colorado potato beetle pressure that same growing season. Great, thank you. And I'll go down the chat and Sarah, let me know if I'm missing anyone. And if you want to do the next one after this, um, we have Paulo, sorry if I'm mispronouncing, from Argentina. So we have quite an international audience and national audience today. Um, wondering what happened with wireworm population on the no-till potato production. Um, increase year by year or less? And I know Ryan also talked about wireworms in the cover crops. So uh, Ken, have you noticed anything? Um, I didn't have much in the way of wireworm problems uh, in these plots, but um, the field where we have wireworm problems is a much uh, finer sandy soil on the opposite side of the laneway. <laughs> 
Uh, so it seems, seems to be very soil, soil and soil texture related on our farm where we have wireworm problems. Ryan, do you want to add anything about the impact of cover? What, I know you mentioned it, but. So far, I don't, haven't necessarily seen that a fall cover has a big impact on wireworm where I've seen it, it, it's more what's grown in rotation with potatoes and what, when is, when are potatoes being harvested? So are they being harvested early? Or are they being harvested late? That'll have a big impact on damage. What's the length of rotation? What's the, what's being grown in rotation with potatoes and are they uh, crops that favor, you know, egg laying and feeding of wireworms? Is there, is there anything in, in rotation that the wireworms don't like, like say buckwheat or mustard or those sorts of things. So um, that I think would have more of an impact than, than, uh, than the sort of the fall cover crop. Okay, thank you. And I think we've already discussed this. Uh, are the plants hilled during the growing season? And I think Ken, you said no, not through yours. And Ryan, I'm not sure um, if that's a question that goes to you either. Don't think so, no. No, uh, I didn't think so. Can um, I add a bit, Tracy, though? Yes. Uh, the hilling issue, I mean, some people suggested they could be, we could hill a field, uh, plant a cover crop, and then plant into those hills in the spring but it messes up your termination of the cover crop, either flail mowing or rolling. Uh, you can't get proper termination of your cover crop if you've got those hills sticking up in the way. So that's an issue. Uh, and of course, once you've planted uh, into all that residue, um, you, you don't want to hill them because any soil, any bare soil you create, that will make a place for weeds to grow because it's really the exclusion of sunlight that uh, gives you the control of weeds with that residue. Great. Thank you, Ken. Ryan, another question for you from Samuel. Um, your discussion followed seeding a cover crop post-harvest. Are there any of the fields left out of rotation for a year to improve soil quality, or is the goal only to fix carbon and nitrogen prior to snowfall with the crops being winter killed? So, uh, there may be two things going on there. My discussion was about cover crop um, po sort of post tillage in the year before potatoes. And that is largely following what I would call uh, a full season cover crop or a, or a service crop or something. So I'd say the majority of acres in PEI, let's say they're on a three-year rotation, uh, it'd be potatoes followed by another cash crop, usually grain or oil seed, um, or maybe pulses, something like that. And then that third year, a lot of the time is a forage crop of some kind, or uh, depending on, again, if they're trying to battle wireworm or verticillium, it might be mustard, or it might be buckwheat, or it's something, maybe it's a biofumigant crop, or it's a you know disease suppressive crop, or sometimes it's relay cropping a little bit. So it might be, you know, winter rye after the you know, after the pulp peas come off and then that actually does survive the winter. And then they come in with an annual crop after the, the rye. So sometimes we'll have people with say four crops in three years or something like that. Um, so it, everybody's a little bit different. It sort of depends on their system and their market and what they're doing and the, you know, what's in their rotation. But um, a lot of the acres in PEI the year before potatoes is not a true cash crop. If it's like, say it's alfalfa, you know, my home farm, we rent out land of potatoes and it's in a five or six year rotation and the head of potatoes is usually two or three years of alfalfa. So um, that alfalfa is being harvested for cattle feed, um, but then, and then potatoes are going in after that. So it's a little bit different in everybody's field. Great. Thank you. Right. Uh, Samuel, did that answer your question? I hope. And if not, feel free to go on uh, video and, and, uh, if there's anything else that you wanted Ryan to answer about that. Okay, is there another question, Sarah, that you have? Yeah, there are a few more. Um, there's a question about if they've tried companion crops with potatoes and also use biological teas or drenches or monitoring, monitoring you know, soil biology, I think, in, in any way. 
So I can say that there's been a little bit of research on companion crops here, specifically around wireworms. So there's been some work in, in Charlottetown around the use of, say, buckwheat or mustard as a sort of seeded, like later in the season, um, as a wireworm suppressor. Um, it hasn't been adopted commercially here, but there is there has been a little bit of work done on that. I know there's some a couple of growers in Colorado that uh, are doing what I would call is reasonably conventional potato production, but they are doing they're they're in, they're doing a little bit of companion cropping with buckwheat and uh, peas because they're not big uh, they're not you know they don't have big nutrient uh, demand and they don't uh, have big root systems so they're not really compromising anything with the potatoes. Uh, he's using them mostly as beneficial um, benef like good good companion crops for say like beneficial insects and things like that um uh, but that hasn't made it to pei yet <laughs> um we have had a few people that have done what i would call nurse cropping so um where you know immediately after or at planting of potatoes they would uh, uh plant something like barley or um or or buckwheat or something that just to emerge quickly and cover the ground at, at the time when before potato emergence. So in that, you know, especially for the long, the varieties that take a long time to get out of the ground, um, just so you have less time with bare ground. Um, again, that's not a widespread practice, but there is a little bit of that happening. Great. All right. Anything else there, Sarah, that we've missed? There's quite a few questions still. There's a question from Carl about um, what what does he think the reason for the yield increase is from the cover crops? So nitrogen supply, water infiltration. I'd say we're still trying to kind of figure that out. Um, we, I'd say there's probably multiple reasons. The cover crop is probably um, holding some nutrients, particularly nitrogen, over till the next year um, that we haven't. We haven't really been able to identify it in our testing yet, but it doesn't mean that there, you know, if it's not free nitrate in the spring, it's sometimes it's hard to tell. But in that, we did have seen that biological N availability peak up a little bit in this cover crop plot. So maybe that's showing that there is a little bit more nitrogen that's available to the crop from the cover crop. Um, but I think there's also just things to be said for you know, uh, having the something green in the field longer is, you know, that soil is working longer. It's got better, hopefully it's got a better um, microbial activity. It's got a better soil biological community. Um, you know, uh, I, I think there's probably multiple reasons for that. Um, you know, and there may also be things like water infiltration and bulk density and things like that, that maybe um, we haven't really been able to capture yet, but um, I think there's probably multiple reasons. Excellent, thank you. There's still lots of discussion here going on. Uh, one, one that I think would be interesting, um, are there any cover crops that should be avoided? And I guess Ken as well, um, any, any crops that, that should be avoided if you're considering potatoes? I guess uh, just you know, check to make sure they don't share that there's no shared diseases uh, or pests between the cover crop and the potatoes. I don't have specific examples, I guess, to avoid, but um, that, that's a consideration when you're when you're combining cover crops with with potato growing. Great, thank it, you. It depends a little bit on what we term as a cover crop because, like, a, in PEI, usually when we talk cover crops, we're talking about fall cover crops as opposed to say like a full season cover crop. Um, ahead of potatoes. If we're talking about fall cover crops, most of the things that we grow as fall covers like barley and oats and radish and mustard so far haven't really shown to be have much in the way of problems with potatoes. We're still working on that and still monitoring that, but so far haven't seen too many problems. With what I would say is our the full season crops ahead of potatoes, Again, like Ken said, you don't, you want to try and avoid things that may be, you know, so, you know, if you've got multiple crops that can, that can multiply um, sclerotinia uh, or, uh, you know, some of those types of uh, problems that can be an issue. Um, we've had some issues, I think, over time with red clover, uh, as I said, tends to build up nematode numbers a little bit. 
Um, annual ryegrass also can build nematode numbers. Anything with a fine root system uh, has the potential apparently to, to multiply root lesion nematodes, and that can be an issue in potatoes, especially if you also have verticillium as an issue. So um, that, you know, that can be uh, something to monitor, but. There was something from Palo again, um, Brian, if you use uh, Tegat's minutia or Sakali cereal, like a cover for potato production, I think you just mentioned that. See, do you see any um, effects for nematode control? from either of those. I, I, I'm not familiar with either of those. Okay. I just, I just know that we, we do try and monitor nematode levels and, and verticillium in a lot of our trials. And um, we haven't seen much impact on the fall seeded covers, but what is grown in rotation with potatoes does have a big impact on both nematode populations and verticillium counts. Um, so particularly, almost everything can be a host for root lesion nematodes, but some things are worse than others. Corn is high for nematodes, soybeans, um, red clover. Um, so some of those crops really can um, exacerbate the, the, the nematode numbers. Sarah, have we missed something in the chat? Sorry. Um, the only one I can see is about fungal to bacterial ratios. Um, has there been any tests for FB ratios in the soil? And can could flowers be included in your system to help control pests? Which we, we maybe Ken hasn't spoken to that, but we've talked a little bit about that. No, we haven't uh, looked at the fungal to bacterial ratio um, in these plots. Uh, it's something would be interesting to measure. Um, and you know, flowers could be. Uh, an interesting assist for pest control. Certainly that's been demonstrated by, uh, I think, Brendan Rocky, uh, who uh, Ryan was referring to in Colorado. Uh, so it, it might be something worth trying. What I also know is even, um, like yeah, I visited some farms in Europe where, or in, and in England where on conventional production, as well as organic production, where um, it's not so much intercropping, but you know, around their headlands and around like their field margins, they are planting sort of like either pollinator mixes or refuges uh, for beneficial insects. And, and that can also have some value as well. And then you don't risk, um, I think sometimes the challenge for some people is like, oh, if you have flowering intercrop in potatoes, but then you're uh, doing say fungicide sprays or insecticide sprays, and you could be bringing the, the beneficials to the field and then spraying them. <laughs> so that's not preferable, but if you have a refuge that you're not spraying on the side, that can be sort of that refuge for them. And then they can kind of come and go in the potato crop. I think there's probably some value to that. Great, thank you. We've had some other comments about, uh, Andre says he, they've had decent results with buckwheat as a companion crop for beneficial predators, um, but the buckwheat must be seeded as early as possible. Uh, after the risk of frost. Uh, there was Samuel as well saying there's new and emerging information on potato farmers utilizing sorghum Sudan grass to avoid losing gluten-free status of their ag land along with the beneficial effects for soil. Is that something being considered? Never heard of land having gluten-free status, but anyway, um, not not to be denigratory. I just something I've never heard of. Um, we, there is a fair bit of sorghum Sudan grass, as well as forage pearl millet being grown in PEI, mostly to for growers that are that are maybe on tighter rotations, or they're trying to fight compaction, or they're trying to um, the forage pearl millet. Uh, has some effect at lowering nematode populations. So for really bad nematode fields that uh, has been valuable either on its own or in a mix with other things. Sorghum sand grass and pearl millet, they basically look the same in the field. They mix really well. Um, so we have got quite a few growers growing those. And then they can also be fed to cattle too. Like you can make silage out of them. So um, we have a few folks that are doing that. Great. Um, I did see a note here just from Kate. She said, yes. uh, I do love red clover. I, red clover in a, you know, corn, soybean, wheat rotation uh, is fantastic. And a lot, you know, wheat peat loves red clover and lots of people love red, red clover. And I, I, 
I'm not as big a fan on red clover I, when I put my dairy guy hat on because I find it doesn't make very good dairy cattle feed. Um, and uh, and then we just we do we have had some of historically we've seen the highest wireworm and the highest verticillium and, and nematode problems following rotations with red clover. So where we've seen a few folks move is they're replacing red clover with alfalfa and um, alfalfa. Yes, the seeds are a little more expensive, but uh, you get a little bit more compaction fighting with alfalfa. You probably fix it, fix a little more nitrogen than you do with red clover. Um, so, and, and it doesn't seem to carry the same diseases. So um, yeah, and it, and it makes better feet, makes better hay. <laughs> Okay, it is after 1.30 and I know that we've had a number of people leave. I know there are still questions in the chat. I am going to propose um, that if you have questions, we will um, send them out to Ryan and Ken and, and perhaps we can get some responses that then I can share with, with the group, if that makes sense. Ryan, Ken, are you okay with that? Yep. Great. Yes. And. Um, I really appreciate uh, Ryan, Ken, Sarah, your help today. It's been great. And uh, I appreciate everyone who joined us today. We are going to, we have recorded this and I will be sharing it. And again, if Ryan and Ken are amenable, I may even share their, um, I know Ken shared his email, but I will, Ryan, if you're amenable, we may be able to share your email as well. There's a you lot can, of- You can, oh, uh, anybody can for, uh, follow me on Twitter. It's just R. Barrett PEI on Twitter. And I usually, during the summer and fall, I tweet a lot of our uh, trial stuff. So uh, feel free to follow me there. Excellent. Excellent. So we'll gather up a little bit more information where you can follow people and uh, seek out more information. I think we're going to see some evolving uh, things come forward as the Living Lab moves forward. So thank you all. And um, with that, I will close the day and uh, I much appreciate your time. And again, thanks for, uh, I learned a lot about potato growing. I, I, I love potatoes, but didn't know a lot about their growing. So thank goodness um, we got lots of potatoes. So thank you all and um, we'll close today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bye all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.